encourage anyone that's you know kind of getting this analysis paralysis or is thinking about it network with the right people but take action get started we're seeing interest rates go up a little bit it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things if you find a good market that's in the path of progress properties are still cash flowing now it's still the right time to invest in real estate So the question is this, how do most agents find the secrets to succeed in today's competitive real estate market, especially when the top agents are keeping those secrets to themselves? That's the question, and this podcast will give you the answer. Hi, I'm Aaron Amuchastegui, and welcome to Real Estate Rockstars. Recording in progress, Real Estate Rockstars. This is Aaron Amuchastegui. Today, I get to interview Zach Lee Master, founder and CEO of Rent to Retirement. I'm really, really excited about this interview. And one of the reasons is lately, I have agents reaching out to me almost every day, asking me for extra coaching and extra guidance. And there was even a gal that reached out to me today about how to build her own investment portfolio. You know, since since COVID hit in 2020, I'm, I've been telling you guys about diversification. I've been telling you guys about you can't just be an agent making money as an agent. You've got to be able to diversify, get these multiple streams of income. And my favorite is with rentals, within with investment properties, with rental investments. And I just thought it was so fitting that lately so many people have been saying, how do I add two or three more houses to my portfolio this year? And I think Zach is the guy that's going to talk about how he built his portfolio and some tips and ideas on how you guys can build yours. Zach. How's it going? Hey, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Very excited to be a part of the show. Yeah, I'm excited that you are here too. I'm excited that, that you're uh, becoming one of our new partners over here. And where, where do you live? Tell everybody where you live. We're in Denver, Colorado. We don't invest here for residential. We invest in areas that you can achieve a, a higher return. But uh, I personally live in Denver. I'm from Wyoming initially. What's your favorite city to invest in? Ooh, that's a tough one. We invest in, in a lot of different areas. Uh, right now, Southwest Florida is an exceptional place where we can really come into a positively cash flowing property and immediate equity, and it's in the path of progress. So I'm going to say Southwest Florida for right now, but we have many exceptional markets we're excited about. Yeah. The, I remember, I, I mean, I, li I live in Austin, Texas now, but I don't, I don't own very many rentals within a hundred miles of where I'm at. Uh, but the, but, but, you know, sometimes to find the best deals, you got to travel out a little bit. And if you're in the heart of Denver, I could see the rentals not being as good there. No the, cash flow, great no appreciation, cash but flow. no cash flow. Yeah. I, the, so how did you get into real estate? Man, looking back, I mean, I actually have a healthcare background and a military background. My wife and I are, are both optometrists by education. We went to school in Portland, Oregon uh, for optometry school. I was on the health profession scholarship program, HPSP with the Air Force. So immediately upon graduating, I went into the Air Force for seven years to practice optometry. Uh, during that entire time, I was investing in real estate. Even my first house was a duplex that I house hacked and ended up keeping that as a rental for many years and then actually 1031ing into, into more rentals over time. I mean, I don't know where I really got the bug, maybe read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, like so many people did back in the day. I've always been fascinated by real estate and really believed in the fundamentals. you know. And so that's, uh, that's really what sparked it. Fast forward to where we're at now. I mean, after I left the military, we, we moved out to Colorado and opened up multiple private practices, did the healthcare thing, still investing in real estate throughout that. Every single year, uh, we, we've bought real estate. And actually every single year since that first duplex, we bought more real estate. Uh, than the previous year. And so we've kind of slowly been scaling our portfolio to the point, Aaron, where we were able to replace our active income as, as professionals and ultimately retire from the uh, healthcare career field. And that caught a lot of people's attention, like, hey, what are you doing? How are you, you know, replacing your income? There's a there's a lot of our friends and family and colleagues that were interested in investing in real estate and doing what, we're, what we were doing. And so that kind of paved the path to the establishment of, of rent to retirement, where we assist investors in acquiring out of state investment turnkey investment properties in the in the best markets where they can you know slowly build and have some hands-on approach and assistance to build their own passive income portfolio so that's i guess the cliff notes of of my story yeah what a great story the you know in uh, one of the masterminds i'm a part of we talk about you know kind of rental income as horizontal income 
or kind of money you make when you're sleeping. If you don't show up for work today, what kind of money uh, are, are you making? And, you know, as anybody with a W-2 job or a real estate agent, most of the money that people earn is based on if you go to work today and you work hard and you keep going, you're going to make money every month. And when I first got into, I was originally a home builder, but when I started like buying properties as investments, I was just a house flipper. And, you know, from 2009, to like 2012 or 13, I flipped a thousand houses and I thought, wow, this is amazing. We'd buy them, we'd fix them, we'd sell them, we'd buy them, we'd fix them, we'd sell them. And I couldn't figure out why people would rent houses. And because I was like, why would you rent and only make like a hundred or $200 a month when you could flip it right now and make this much money? And then, you know, 2013 Blackstone comes in the market, puts me out of business. I lost all the money I had earned. And I, and I remember thinking back, if I would have just kept 50 of those houses or a hundred of those houses, I would have been set for life. I would have retired, right? I could have retired at 25 instead of being starting over again at 25. And so you, um, it seemed like pretty early in your career of being like a W2 earner, you had that goal of, no, I need to create that horizontal income. I essentially, you need to set yourself up to retire. Was your first one up in, uh, up in Oregon or Ranger school? No, we bought our first duplex in, uh, in North Dakota. That's where I was first stationed. So. Okay. Do you still own it? Not now. I mean, that shoot, that was probably 15 years ago. We owned it for, for many years and then actually 1031 did because we held it more than five years mm -hmm. um, and had to end up 1031 ing it. But uh, yeah, I mean, I love what you're saying because you can trade, a lot of people want to trade that quick nickel for the long dime, you know, but really where people build generational wealth in real estate. And what we've seen is just, just holding it over time. I mean, cash flow is important, but really when you're coupling all the benefits of real estate ownership over time with appreciation, debt reduction, and using, using leverage to scale your portfolio, also mitigating against inflation and using those tax benefits. And then you have depreciation and other exciting things you can do. That's how you really create wealth and then scale that over time. That's very much, I mean, yes, we were flipping houses and had a management business as well, but we, we didn't get to that point of leaving our active income without you know, having the, the rental portfolio. And that one to $200 a door, I mean, that adds up and that goes up over time too, as, as rents increase. So I love that you mentioned that. Yeah. We've seen that a lot over the past, you know, when I first got into rentals in 2015, after I'd lost it all, I was like, you know what? I want boring. I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy these houses. I'll refinance. I'll only make an extra hundred dollars a month. And I, at that time, I thought I'd picked a market where, where house prices will never go up, but this will be nice and safe because I just don't want to go broke again. So I'll do it slower this time. And then, yes, you not only get the benefit of, well, we've had a crazy few years of appreciation, which let us do a lot of refinances where now we have that infinite return, but we're seeing rents increase year over year right now, something like, like 20 and 30%. So it's, it is a... Uh, seems like a pretty brilliant investment right now as, as people go through it and real estate has all of its different seasons, but as you're, as people are holding through time, you know, so I, I remember sometimes I've been on social media and I'll say, Hey, I bought this house, you know, this duplex for, for 300,000. I'm renting both sides for 1500 and it's new construction. And people will say, how do you do that? I can't find anything near me that has returns like that. And the, and I think your story is probably the same where you were looking as you're like living in Denver, you're looking around, and then the next question people say is, well, how can you invest in a place where you don't live? Right. And what would, and, and that's essentially all you do. What would you, what do you tell people when they ask you that? Like, Zach, how am I going to invest somewhere else? Yeah. The most successful investors are ourselves included. I mean, the people that we learned from, they weren't just invested in their own backyard. That feels comfortable mm -hmm. just because you, you know, the market. And actually sometimes I think that's a little bit of a hindrance because if you have something that's, that's so local, it could be a distraction. You could be focused on it. Maybe that's not the, maybe your own backyard is not the most strategic place to invest. There's a lot of markets in the U S and there's a lot of different opportunity. I think people are a little bit scared or they just don't know how to transition to invest out of state. Well, it's, it's quite easy. It's actually, it's the same process, Aaron is buying a, buying a house locally. You need to go through the same exact steps you do. You need to research markets. You need to determine what your criteria is identify areas that are congruent with, with your goals and criteria. You need to find the, you need to build a local team, whether that's local or across the country, it's all about having the right team in place to really build a successful business, because that's what you're doing when you're building an investment portfolio, whether it's local or otherwise, you're, you're building a business and you just need to approach it the right way. And there are, I mean, this is really the foundation of, of our company at rent to retirement because we've already been through that. We've already been successful investors building these teams and systems in place to allow other investors to follow that same process 
where they know they have good property management set up. There's standards for rehab. We do a lot of new construction um, and we're in, in different markets that adhere to our investment criteria. So I think to answer your question, the big thing is to first network with the right people, identify what areas are the ones that you do want to invest in, because it's important to be diversified over time. I think you never want to have all of your investments in, in one central location, and it may not even be realistic. Denver, for example, I mean, taxes are so high here and the prices have appreciated so much and rents have not appreciated to keep up with those to be able to cash flow. It just wouldn't make sense. We can take, we can buy a half a million dollar house here to have break even cash flow and decent appreciation, possibly negative cash flow with taxes, but we can take that same amount of capital and get double digit returns in other parts of the country, which will help us scale up quicker. So you just got to be, I, I guess, open to the idea and network with the right people to find the systematic approach and, and frankly, just do it. Yeah. Real Estate Rockstars, this is Aaron Amuchastegui for a quick commercial break. So during 2020 and 2021, the real estate market completely changed. There's so much competition in the market, so many people trying to buy and sell houses, but there's hardly any supply, hardly any product, hardly anyone willing to list their homes. It's time for every agent out there to become a hybrid agent investor to be able to reach out directly to homeowners to try to get them to sell or list their house. We've got a new website. Go to leadpropeller.com and you can set up your own investor buyer website in just minutes. You'll set up your own URL, set up phone numbers, help go through the leads, help reach out to people that aren't listing their, pro their property currently and have them fill out a form that says, hey, I want to sell my house. And then as an agent, you can go through and make them a hybrid offer. You can tell them, hey, I think your house would sell for $220,000 on MLS, but I can either write you a $180,000 cash offer right now or I can help you fix it up and you'll list it for 220,000 on MLS. These are buyers that are looking for quick cash offers. Tens of thousands are submitting these forms every single day and they're skipping the listing process. But so many of you guys out there are such good agents. It's a great opportunity to get that lead and help them maximize sales price for their home. So again, go to leadpropeller.com and think about signing up for your own investor site. So buyers will start reaching out to you asking you to make an offer on their home. You know, over the last couple of years too, we've seen a lot of um, kind of government intervention in the rental space, right? So you talk about being diversified. Sometimes people are like, well, even if they have good deals near their house, like even if they live in one of those cities that are great, like here's, we learned some reasons this year why to be diversified. There were some counties and some cities that, that landlords had their full rights ever, you know, all through 2020 and could do evictions if people didn't pay and could run things through. And there were some states that are still just now starting evictions from people that haven't paid since March of 2020. So government intervention, the, I think what, what uh, early 2020 taught us is like anything can happen, right? So even though you think like this is a very, very safe investment or a very, very safe city here, um, not wanting to have all your eggs in one basket, I think is, uh, I think you're totally right, especially with the government intervention with the, sometimes some places are now in putting in uh, rental caps where, you know, you can't raise rents over a certain amount every year. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of landlord friendly States. There's a lot of less landlord friendly States. And as we're seeing appreciation and markets change, you know, I have a lot of houses that are uh, near one of the biggest army bases in the world. Right. So the, we have a, we have a ton of them in there and we thought about, why don't we have all of them there because they're the best return? Well, we don't have all of them there because what if, you know, something happens to that base or what if, you know, if, if all of a sudden there's a, a conflict in the world and a lot of the people get stationed somewhere, like what happens to housing in those towns? And so, yeah, being, being diversified, I think there's so many things. I think the biggest reason to be diversified, we can't even comprehend why we might need to be because you just never know the worst things that happen are ones that we could not have predicted. And we're like, Oh man, I'm sure glad I have another plan. And sometimes you just get lucky. I mean, it's, it's important to have investments in different areas because if you're in the path of progress, maybe you enter into a market where you can still have affordability and cash flow, but over the next five to 10 years, that market dramatically grows and you, you kind of ride that appreciation wave. Um, but you're still having a cash flowing investment property. I mean, it's, it's just important, I think, to have a little bit of diversity just to take advantage of, of some of the market cycles and shifts that, what, as you mentioned, we can't even predict. When we evaluate a market that we want to enter into, we, we run a lot of census and statistical analysis to determine what is a good market. We want areas that, as you mentioned, are landlord-friendly legislation. 
it's very challenging. There's, as you talked about with some, I mean, and we're not city naming right now or city shaming, but right. uh, there, there's certain areas where shoot, if a tenant wants to stay in that property and just squat, you, you can't evict them. And it's an uphill battle. And, uh, you know, they could be there. We've heard these horror stories of tenants squatting in properties for over a year, not being able to evict them, not being able to pursue them for, for damages or, or do rent rent caps as as you mentioned i think oregon was the first state that has a statewide rent cap in imposed and so there's a lot of things to be conscious of we want to be in areas that are in the path of progress and have population economic growth you got to look at the sustainability of the market so we look at areas that have a diversity of industries and economies look at areas where the fortune 500 companies are coming in to develop jobs transportation those are all things that are important we always attend the city planning meetings um, that are for each one of these locations you also got to look at the the cash flow numbers and what is the what is the affordability of the market i think it's really a good idea to be investing in areas that are below the median house price point nationally and also on a microeconomic scale for those specific areas and then you compare that to the rent rent values in those areas so anytime you can have uh, an affordable market that you can still cash flow i mean that's fundamental real estate investing 101 to set yourself up for success long term and then you also look at things like taxes real estate taxes also state income taxes are important to consider so those are all things that we look at when evaluating a market dude that is a this is a great list we need to take that list and be able to put it on some of our like our social media memes and messages that we send out you're saying before you go into a place you're going to make sure it's landlord friendly you're going to make sure they have population growth they're in the path of progress it's a place the fortune 500 would want to be uh, that you can get cash flow affordability prices below the median price nationwide you know tax friendly states those are a lot of good things like some that's those are questions somebody asks how can i choose another city right zach just gave you guys a big list of things that you can look for uh, yourselves as you're going out there to say, how can I choose the right place? Zach, you also mentioned having the right team, right? So if somebody's going to go, they've done that. They've said, Hey, I really want to go invest in, <clears throat> in this town. And now I go look on MLS. So I go look on Zillow and I see one for sale. Now I got to get my team together to figure out, you know, what's next, who should they be finding on their team? And when you first went into markets, how did you go about finding those new team people that are now part, you know, that are already part of, part of you? Yeah, it's an uphill battle. And I think finding the right the right people and in, in team is first and foremost and more important than any individual market or investment property. You got to have the right people in place. And sometimes that's just trial and error. I mean, if you can tap into a mar into a network of people that's already successful in that area, and I do think that is a benefit of, of going kind of the turnkey route through an organization like ourselves, but you know, we've already established that footprint and built those teams. But if you're looking at a market that you're unfamiliar with and you don't have anyone there, you got to build that team first. And this is, this is everyone that's involved. You need a CPA that is familiar with the tax code for that area and can file, you know, your, your um, state income tax for that area. If you even need to, you need to have obviously the right agents and brokers. You need to have defined criteria with them to determine exactly what your buy box is and what you're looking for Obviously, You know, property management is obviously a very essential piece for long-term success right contractors if you're going to be acquiring properties that need to have rehabilitation work done to them. Uh, I mean, there's the, the list goes on, but to be real successful and in building an investment, an investment portfolio, and you know this, Aaron, because you invest in so many different areas and you've done this successfully. I mean, I turn the question back around to you, but for, from our experience, you know, you build a team first and sometimes that is trial and error. Obviously, if you were tapped into a network and you can have ask for references and things like this. That's a good place to start. Sometimes you got to go through 10 or 20 bad contractors or property managers to find a good one. But when you do find a good one and you build that team over time, that's what sets the foundation to scale up and be successful in that area. The, uh, I, I love that part you just said. It's, a th it's one of the things I tell some of the, the people on my team all the time. It took me 15 contractors before, 15 painters before I found the Epic Painter like the one that could do it great. And he could do it for a third of the price of everybody else. And it was like this happy bonus when a roof needs, when a roof needs to get replaced, it's always interesting. You get five quotes and we'll get 7,000, 7,000, 6,000, 3,000. Right. And the, and sometimes it rotates, but like, as you get to see it, you're like, okay, so this guy is the least expensive roofer today because he isn't busy this month. And next month he may be the 7,000 and, and they may rotate. But the, but I remember going through so many painters, and then, uh, so now as we, end, whenever we enter new markets, it's, it's uh, the, the guys on my team that are responsible that are probably listening right now that are, you know, we go into new markets and I say, Hey, you got to go find the painter, find the contractor. It can be a frustrating battle 
and they're like, they're trying. And then they, they come back to me at their frustration. They're like, man, so this guy didn't actually show up or this guy showed up, but he didn't send us the pictures or we showed up and he, and he sent us pictures, but when we went on site, it was a total bad job. And I tried to help them. I would tell them like celebrate. It's, it's even a win when you find out that one contractor is a bad one. Cause you're one step closer to the good one. Cause it is a numbers game. Sometimes you get lucky. The very first landscaper I ever hired when I was flipping houses out in California became one of my favorite contractors ever and used her on a thousand houses. Right. But the, but then there's other contractors that you just go through. So sometimes we get lucky, but it is a numbers game. And as you build those teams, uh, it just takes, takes trial, trial and error, but you're one step closer as long as you have that long-term plan, you know, something that you've done, you talked about buying more houses every year. It's like, so obviously your business, you guys help so many other people, but even for yourself, you're buying properties year over year over year. And talk about the tax benefits a little bit, because lately all over social media and like, and radio and everything else, people have been saying, you have to buy, you know, big commercial properties. Cause if you buy these big commercial properties, you can do cost segregation studies and you can wipe out your taxes and not have to pay taxes. People are not talking about avoiding taxes with like, you know, single family duplexes, fourplexes. And I think that the, I think there's a big strategy behind that, that you said that you've implemented. Talk a little bit about that because I, I think people miss the boat a lot in single family with that. Yeah. I mean, music to my ears. I think that uh, taxes are, are most definitely I think the biggest benefit to investing in real estate, there's nothing else out there that comes close. And just for everyone's information, Aaron, I, I don't do any investing outside of real estate. We don't do any stocks, bonds, commodities. We don't do crypto. I think it was Warren Buffett that said, invest in what you know and, and nothing more. And that is the only, real estate is the only thing that we, we personally invest in. And I, the more and more experience we get, I am just constantly amazed at the tax benefits and how the tax code is written for real estate investors. There's a reason why all of Congress owns, you know, uh, income producing property or real estate investments to some degree. And I, I think that's going to continue the tax benefits that we see as, as the government tries to motivate people to stimulate the economy and, and be productive in the, the building and investment space in real estate. But I mean, overall, real estate has so many different tax benefits. We look at even the cash flow that you receive. Uh, we kind of call it tax-free income, even though it's it's subject to tax because of all the write-offs with management, your your mortgage interest, any expenses on the property. Depreciation alone should knock out just regular depreciation just from owning a rental property, not doing anything beyond with accelerated depreciation. That's going to, going to offset your, your taxable income. So if you build an investment portfolio that's yielding you, say, $100,000 a year in, in passive income, that's close to tax free. I mean, that could be equivalent to 150, 160, maybe 200 in certain parts of the country where your your tax bracket is. Depending, you know, that could yield a very substantial income that you actually get to keep. And then you have things like 1031 exchanges where you can grow and scale your portfolio, and that's inevitable. You can 1031 all the way up to never have to pay taxes and pass properties on to your to your heirs and to your children tax-free to a certain extent. I mean, there's things like that, that nothing else comes close to. You mentioned cost segregation studies. That is something we do. You can do cost segregation studies on individual properties. Now you need to be obviously conscious of being a real estate professional and what your long-term plan is. You can 1031 cost segregation studies um, into other assets, but those are recuperable or recoverable if, if you sell the property. A 1030 or a cost segregation study is just accelerated depreciation. Our goal every single year is to buy enough real estate where we do wipe out our taxable income for that year, because that gives us that much more income to then not have to give to Uncle Sam and then go reinvest and actually earn income on it and scale it. And there's things like that when you look at all of that combined that just allow you to dramatically scale your portfolio and create generational wealth. That's why we love real estate. Yeah. Hey, real estate rock stars. This is Aaron Muchastegui, and I'm interrupting myself to bring you this commercial break from one of our sponsors. And I know, I know you guys would much rather listen to the content and not the ads and not the sponsors, but this is one that I'm actually super, super excited with. You know, so many of the realtors that we interview on the show, they talk about how much systems are important and how much follow-up is important. And I'm really, really excited about our new sponsor. There's somebody I've been looking at for a long time. And when they reached out to me, I said, yes, we have to be able 
to do this deal. So that sponsor is Follow Up Boss. You know, on an interview last week with Agent Mark McGuire, I asked him what his favorite software and what his favorite system was. And he said it was Follow Up Boss. And then he went on for another three or four minutes to talk about why Follow Up Boss was the best CRM he uses. So there's a lot of superstars out, out there that use Follow Up Boss. Some of the stats they gave me, Robert Slack, 1.5 billion team in Florida, number one in the US. He uses Follow Up Boss to get a 400% ROI on his massive paid lead spend. Deborah Beagle, co-owner of the Ashton Group in Nashville, uses Follow Up Boss to guarantee the agents who join her team get two homes under contract in the first 90 days. That's a big guarantee for new agents. Barry Jenkins of the, your friends in real estate uses Follow Up Boss to automate everything so his team can produce 200 million on 25 hour work weeks. All right, so here's an offer. You guys are gonna get this special for being Real Estate Rockstars listeners. Now I've, I've used Follow Up Boss. We've actually used it in our non real estate businesses as well because it's so good at being able to set timers, set automatic texting and emailing. And what do, what do you know, best name ever, Follow Up. So here's what we got. For Real Estate Rockstars listeners, you get a 30 day free trial. That's normally 14 days. So in order to get this, you go followupboss.com forward slash rockstars. So again, followupboss.com, just like it sounds, forward slash rockstars. Go there, get your 30 day free trial and check it out. Especially if you aren't using any systems or any CRMs yet, this will be a great one for you to start with. All right, everybody, thanks again. Now back to our show. We should, I want us to, to dive into a few of those tactics just a little bit more. I mean, one of the one of the benefits of most of our listeners, right? So most of our listeners out there, you guys are licensed real estate agents. So one of the hurdles getting some of these deductions is you have to be a real estate professional. If someone's a doctor investing in real estate, it's a little bit harder, right? They have to, they have to do some extra things to get the full uh, depreciation, full write-offs that the, that most of our listeners get. And it's not that doctors can't, right? But there just are different processes on that. But let's talk about the, the 1031 exchange for a second. I think it's, it, it I think it's a pretty, my, my understanding of it is pretty simple. Hopefully you can correct me or, or make it even better. My understanding of it at 1031 is if somebody's going to, they buy a house for $50,000 and now they're selling it for a hundred. Normally they would have to pay a tax on that gain. And the percentage depends on kind of how long they've owned it. But if you do a 1031, when you're getting ready to sell it, you say, I'm actually going to reinvest this in real estate. And if it's reinvested into a similar investment, they don't have to pay taxes on that $50,000 gain. It gets pushed into this new one. How close did I get with that? How, how am I doing with that on a summary? Pretty close? No, you're, you're spot on. There's obviously some timeline associations with that. I mean, the real benefit of, of 1031s is to, I mean, the government offers these sort of tax incentives to incentivize people to go out and create more business and stimulate the economy through investing. So this isn't a tax loophole. It's a tax incentive. That, and there's many people doing this, but you're absolutely correct in how you explain that. You have to hold properties for longer than a year, have the intention to hold them longer than the year as, as a rental. So this isn't really something house flippers can take advantage of. Another added benefit of being focused on long-term buy and holds, as you grow your equity over time, that is something that you can trade up and buy other real estate without having to pay those capital gains. Capital gains could be you know, that 20 to 25%, give or take, depending on your state, if you're, if you're selling that asset. And once you sell it, you have 45 days to identify another property, 180 days to actually close on the property. And it's a great way to scale up. You can, you can use land, you can use um, take real estate. You know, what we see with a lot of our clients is actually growing a small portfolio of single family, letting those appreciate over a handful of years, three to six years, what have you, and then actually scaling up and selling some of those to branch into multifamily or some commercial or something like that. So 1031s are, are awesome. And it is a you work with a qualified intermediary. This is this is someone that is actually walking you through the process because the funds can't actually hit your account. They go to a separate escrow account when when you close, and then the 1031 in, intermediary transfers those account or the the funds to the new account when you acquire the new property. But that's an excellent way to scale your portfolio and not have that that tax burden. And you can inevitably never pay taxes on those. We just did another interview with uh, our guy Dave Foster that does who's our QI that we use. And he's a great resource to go through and talk about 1031s. But you can, he has a segment where he talks about 
perpetually delaying ta- or inevitably, you know, never paying taxes on trading up. And I love that idea. We want to create generational wealth for you know years to come for our family, and that's a perfect way to do it. Yeah, you know, I asked you at the beginning, "Hey, do you still own that first house?" And your first response was like, "No, that was a really long time ago." Like one of the coolest parts about 1031 and, and kind of what we've got really lucky for in just the past couple of years. So when I first started you know, flying out to Texas and buying in 2015, I was buying houses at that time. They were about 10 to 15 years old, right? So they were good price, good rentals, but they were older houses, maybe 20 years old. Well, now it's been seven years. Now prices have gone have gone way up on those, but also so has the age of the house, and so has some of the maintenance. So now it's time trying to decide: Am I ready to start replacing HVAC systems? Am I ready to start replacing roofs, or do I want to trade up? And so we're selling those houses in order to use that money to buy these newer houses, and kind of like trading up in that process, getting nicer assets uh, that little bit less work. And so you know, 1031 being such a a really cool part of that, of getting the benefits of the appreciation of something that you had, and then and not only like now you're getting a new property that rents for more. And there's going to be less maintenance because it's newer. I love the strategies behind that. Talk about the just normal depreciation for a little bit, like break that down. So somebody buys a house for $200,000. Let's say, you know, their, their net income that year is going to be like 8,000 after all of their different expenses. How does just straight regular depreciation kind of work in that scenario? Single family, um, the government gives a 27 and a half year depreciation schedule. I don't know where that number came from, but it, it is what it is. Technically, you remove land uh, from that. So it's just based on improvements. A lot of the single family that we see or um, you know, the land really isn't worth a significant amount. So the majority of, of the improvements of the price is, is the actual depreciable value. But I'm going to simplify your, your example a little bit more just to use real or kind of uh, easy numbers. Let's say a hundred thousand dollar house, cash flows uh, two hundred fifty dollars net um, net income a month. That would that would yield you call it three three thousand uh, annually on that hundred thousand dollar house. What you do is you you take it and divide it by twenty seven and a half years, which would give you roughly thirty five hundred dollars in depreciation that you, that offsets that passive income from that property. So in theory, with that example, and those are actually pretty similar numbers to what we're seeing in some of our Midwestern turnkey properties, depreciation alone is actually offsetting any taxable income on on that particular property. Um, If you, you know, there's other things you can do, like we mentioned with potential accelerated depreciation, commercial, you're looking at 39 years uh, for those asset classes, but everyone gets depreciation. That's a beautiful thing of just owning rental properties. This is something you should, if you own rental properties, you actually are required to claim this, you know, year after year. And and that's a way that we can kind of create this tax-free income from just rental properties. Yeah. What a, uh, it's, it's, it's really just such a, such an interesting process that as you get to, as you get to oversimplify that, the, depending on what tax bracket people are in, right? Like, so if, if you're making $10,000 tax-free, It's like making 13,000 or like making 14,000 or like making 15,000. So sometimes people could say, I could invest in this instead of real estate and I'll make an extra thousand or 2,000 a year. But if now they're making 12,000 instead, but they're actually getting taxed, they don't have the same depreciation factors on it. Tax depreciation is huge. And as all of you listeners get more and more successful, right? And we have bigger and bigger tax, but the more successful you get in life, your biggest expense becomes taxes. Right. So the, for the wealthiest people in America, you know, the essentially if they're, if, if they're build their taxes, taxes, they'll spend more money on taxes than they'll spend on mortgages and things like that, you know, during the year. So it's uh, it becomes that biggest expense. One of the biggest things to be able to protect and learn about. So it's funny. I have all these stickies as I start to add in different stuff, but I want to hear about your business. So, so what does rent to retirement do? Yeah, rent retirement is a basically a turnkey operator, a turnkey provider, and that's a very broad term. Most people have heard "quote unquote" turnkey, and that could mean a handful of things. When we talk about turnkey, it's it's a very defined sort of category of of how we operate. As we mentioned previously, Aaron, we identify the best markets throughout the U.S. that combine cash flow appreciation and equity. We go into those markets and personally invest and build our local teams and systems in place to have a systematic approach to be able to build a investment property for ourselves and our investors in these different markets throughout the US. 
We work in, I think, 12 different markets right now. We operate in single family and multifamily. We have commercial. We do a lot of new build and development projects. But basically what we offer, what we sell to our clients are investment properties that are either fully renovated or newly built, leased and professionally managed, allowing them easy access to already tap into a team and a network of professionals that has been successful in that market and to come in and identify properties that fit their criteria to build their own passive income portfolio. In addition to that, we we want to take a comprehensive approach to assist clients in really building out a a business strategy and investment plan. Yes, we're selling turnkey real estate, but it goes much beyond that. We want to set our investors up for success because that means there's a high likelihood they're going to refer other people and come back themselves to invest with us long-term. No one is in this game just to buy one rental property and be done. People are wanting to build a, a portfolio to obtain you know, financial independence or replace their income, whatever the goals are. And when you're building an investment portfolio, you're building a business. There's a lot of important aspects that need to be considered into that from a tax, legal, accounting, financing side. If they want to take it to the next step and do some of those things like the 1031 cost like studies, we have professionals that assist with that. We have real estate specific attorneys and CPAs that uh, can assist with filing taxes out of state, setting up LLC structures if they need to, because that can be done a lot of different ways. And someone that's doing research about that, it might be a little daunting as they hear, okay, you need to do the LLC this way or this way. And it it may vary. But my point I'm making is it's important to have a network and a team that is established in the area that's already got a proven track record of success. And working with a team of professionals that is real estate centric, there's a lot of CPAs and a lot of people that are agents and brokers out there. There's a lot of different attorneys, but you really need people that are really familiar and specific to exactly your goals with what you're trying to accomplish and in the real estate space. So that's really what what we do is is offering turnkey investment properties where people can have that systematic approach, a little bit of handholding and and mentorship throughout that process where they know they're working with an established team to allow them to easily diversify and tap into these markets. Yeah. Now, I know our, I know our listeners are learning a whole bunch of stuff today, right? And I'm sure they're out there taking down the notes of making sure the CPA knows about depreciation and you know some of those things that you look at when you're going into these markets. But I'm sure there's going to be uh, there's going to be a lot of agents that are going to want to reach out to you to be able to you know buy this. Some of them maybe it's even for some clients of theirs. So if somebody reaches out to you and are they you're like, hey, I've got this, this house that's a duplex. Are they investing? pooled with other people on houses? Are they buying individual assets for themselves? So it's like, hey, you can buy this house or this duplex. They own it and you have the management company with it. Are they, are they, are they owning individual pieces of real estate or is it like a fund? How does that work? I mean, we do, we do have syndications on, on larger commercial properties and, and crowdfunding uh, opportunities if someone just wants to lend money on something. But the core of our business is assisting people with actually property ownership, physically purchasing a property. The first step we take anyone through is just jumping on an initial consultation with our clients to go through and learn about their investment goals and experiences, their criteria, their resources, looking at different inventory to see where that would uh, be congruent with their goals. We want them to actually have the property ownership themselves because that's where you get the best benefits is actually through property ownership. When you combine all the things like cash flow appreciation, debt reduction through the tenant paying the loan down, using leverage to offset inflation and scale your portfolio. I mean, that's I think that's where you really create long-term generational wealth is from actual property ownership and take the best advantages of, of the tax code. So it's it's someone that is actually owning the property and, and that's the, the bulk of what we do. Yeah. Have you guys set up any commission referrals or anything like that? If an agent sells a house in DC and, and their their client wants to invest in Florida now, do they, is there a way? All the time. Them? Yeah. We, we work with participating brokers and agents. Um, you know, we have a lot of people that are, especially in today's market that are selling their 1950 house or whatever the case is in, in California for you know a million and a half dollars. And they want to parlay that into an immediate cash flowing portfolio um, you know, so we work with investors all the time, uh, that, that want to do that and cooperate with, uh, with participating agents, brokers. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah those new, new construction assets are so fun and being able to kind of switch around. And I love being able to invest in other markets. And I think we started the whole conversation when I, when I was living in California, the, it was, it, you find these markets where a million dollar house rents for $4,000 a month but a $100,000 house rents for $1,000 a month. 
So people start to think like, wait, I could have 10, $100,000 houses and I make $10,000 a month. So it was like finding those markets that like the smaller the house, the higher the return, the, this is really a way that somebody who is conscious about investing can have kind of that, that infinite return. You know, now you've been doing this for a long time. When you first got into investing in real estate or, you know, particular investing in real estate somewhere where you didn't live, what's one thing that you wish you would have known when you first started that maybe would have made part of that road a little bit easier? I think there's a lot of things, you know, a lot of stumbling blocks that we all go through. Um, and I, these, all these successful investors that are still investing today will, will go through that. I mean, one of my greatest mentors always told me you either make money or you learn investing in real estate. He refused to say that you, you lose money. Um, although sometimes that, that obviously happens, but those are learning lessons. Um, I would say if looking back hindsight, I just, and this would probably be true for a lot of people. I wish I would have got started sooner and been more aggressive earlier on in building my portfolio because time is on your side. Time can be against you for not taking action or it can be on your side. Every single year that you own a property, the property is appreciating over time, regardless of short-term fluctuations, the debt's being paid down on it. You get those tax benefits, rents going up over time. We didn't really talk about inflation too much, but that's the point that I always think about, especially right now as we're having so much inflation and we're likely to over the next few years. Inflation can be a tool. If you are invested in an a-, a hard asset like real estate, inflation causes rents to increase over time. It causes the house price to go up versus, and you're using leverage, which then is devalued. You know, The money that you're borrowing today is paid back with future dollars. Um, so, I mean, inflation can be a tool when you're taking out debt and using real estate as an asset. But going back, I mean, I would say you just got to take action, get out there and network with people. Yes, it's important to listen to podcasts and do some reading, but just if, if you haven't bought your first property, your first property out of state, you don't want to just jump right into it. You want to obviously reach out and network with people and find the right location. But at some point, you do have to just jump right into it and kind of get started. That's how you become comfortable investing out of state and allows you to scale up over time. So I don't know if that's a super concrete answer, Aaron, but I would encourage anyone that's you know kind of getting this analysis paralysis or is thinking about it, network with the right people, but take action, get started. We're seeing interest rates go up a little bit. It doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. If you find a good market that's in the path of progress, properties are still cash flowing. Now is still the right time to invest in real estate. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, we talk about that analysis paralysis too. There's so many people like the ready aim, ready aim. You know, they, 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 they look so much at the deal. They get so nervous at the deal that they never get to buy a deal. And the, and even bad deals I've learned an incredible amount on. And I made more, more deals later. It is so much about being able to, yeah, do the research, be ready. But the, probably the biggest thing about, um, you know, part of your answer was do it sooner. And the one thing I know for sure is I wish I would have started keeping rentals sooner. I wish that I would have, you know, when I was flipping all of those houses, like bought hundreds of houses in 2009, like I go, why didn't I just keep four or five of those? Why didn't I just keep four or five the next year? And it, even if it's just adding like the, the lady that reached out to me today, she's like, I want to have, she has 10 rentals and she wants to have 20 in the next two or three years, she just wants to add two or three a year. But the, but in 10 years, that's going to be such a huge, does not seem very difficult to get there. It seems like there'd be a very clear path for her to reach that goal. And in 10 years, she'll be so glad that she did. And um, yeah, the uh, let's, let's do it sooner and find those places. And you just got to jump in. It just takes consistency, consistency with action. I mean, you're right, but long-term buy and hold rental real estate, housing tenants is, is not super sexy. You know, we don't have the HDTV uh, house flipping, you know, where you, you get those big returns and have a turn a terrible, ugly house into a beautiful house. I mean, that's all really exciting stuff that I think motivates a lot of people, but you really got to have that long-term goal in place and take action towards it consistently. Because if, even if you're acquiring a couple houses every single year, and that's the goal, yeah, you wake up in five or 10 years and you have a large portfolio that you've consistently worked towards. It's really cool when you get to the point where your properties are buying properties you know, you're, you're saving up and you're trading up. I always explain to people that real estate investing, it's not a linear graph of progression. It's very much an exponential graph. Now it's slow in the beginning when you're just getting started. But if you just stay the course and have good investing fundamentals, investing in the right markets and investing for cash flow, I mean, the sky's the limit. No one, no one stops and invest- I haven't met someone that's been real successful in real estate. It's like, okay, I'm good. I'm done. You know, um, sure. Goals change and things are dynamic over time, but Real estate investing is a lifelong journey, you know, and I think every time you you learn something more and more every single 
property you buy every single year that you own property and you just got to stay the course. Yeah. And that, you know, that thing you said about inflation too, for everybody, like the biggest protection is right now, there's a lot of inflation going on. We're talking about more. The biggest protection you have is rental properties because rent goes way up. I had a tenant this month that we, the rate, the rent, the rent raised 30% year over year because of what's happening in that market with inflation. And it's still below market. We were still giving a discount by raising it 30%, but the mortgage was exactly the same. So rent went up $300 a month. Mortgage is still $700 a month. Right. It went, you know, it went from 1200 to 1500 mortgage is still 700. It's the ultimate hedge against inflation. Um, this has been really exciting, you know, and, and for listeners, I reached out to Zach and asked Zach to kind of join on as, as one of our partners and one of our sponsors, because you guys have heard me over the last year saying how important it is to start investing in real estate. And I think that it's really awesome how big of a portfolio Zach has been able to build for himself and build for others and really made such a quick way and an easy way for people that, that want to do it, but are maybe too busy in their real estate business as it stands, or they want to do it and they need some help along there. If you want to do it on your own, Zach taught you guys all sorts of ways today of ways to look when you're considering investing out of state, how to go find those best places. But if you want to jumpstart that, I encourage you to go reach out to Zach and learn some more. Zach, what's the best way they can find you reach out if they want to hear more about your markets or send their referrals your way? You know, what's, what's the best way for, for reaching out? Absolutely. Feel free to visit our website. It's renttoretirement.com. That's rent to retirement.com. They can call 1-800-311-6781. Email info at rentretirement.com. I and mean, we'd love to connect with anyone. We love just talking real estate, talking taxes, you know, giving some market advice. If someone's looking, whether they're looking to invest with us or not, you know, all of, all of our team are real estate professionals and have been successful investors that are past, passionate about real estate. So, I mean, we're happy to speak with anyone just about their investment goals, different markets. The first thing we want to do is set up a consultation with anyone that's wanting to work with us to go through and kind of map out an initial plan. So yeah, we'd, we'd be happy to speak with anyone. All right. Very good. The, uh, so listeners, you heard it. Reach out to Zach, even if you guys just need some advice in some areas, Zach, I know people will. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks for joining us in partnership, but also thanks for providing so many values for our listeners today, Zach. Aaron, it's been a pleasure. Had a lot of fun. Awesome. And then Real Estate Rockstars. Thanks for listening. All right, Real Estate Rockstars. This is Aaron Muchastegui jumping in again to thank you for listening to the show. Hopefully you guys loved listening to that one. And I want to make sure that you know about all of the extra resources that we have. And also we need your help. They say podcasts are free. You get to listen to podcasts for free. But what is the cost of that podcast? I would say if I could beg you to pay anything for that podcast, I would say the cost of the podcast is going and giving a review. So whether you download it on Google or Apple or YouTube or anywhere else, please go give us a review. Say what you liked, what you didn't like. It helps us get better guests. The more reviews, the higher we get in the rate rankings. Right now, we are the biggest podcast out there for real estate agents. And we want to keep that spot because we know there's lots of podcasts out there. So go give us a review. Also, be sure to go to hybendigital.com. If you liked any of the resources that those real estate agents talked about, we've got a huge video vault of those resources for free. Every penny that comes on the podcast that we interview, they give us something that helps them get their deals or helps them work with their clients. And we put that in the toolbox in our vault for you. So go to hybendigital.com and you can get it. If you're looking for real estate education, go to rebusuniversity.com. We have all sorts of courses in there to help agents succeed in real estate, how to get the listing, how to negotiate deals, you know, how to become an investor, all sorts of different stuff, rebusuniversity.com. And if you want to chat with me, go find me on Instagram. If you come find me on Instagram, you can send me messages. Tell me what you want to hear. Tell me what you liked, what you didn't like. We try to put a bunch of content out there too. You can find me in two different places. It's at rerockstars.com for our Real Estate Rockstars page or at erinamuchastegui.com for my personal Instagram page where I can chat with you about all sorts of different things. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon.